And uh, I'm going to begin by talking about the small molecule pipeline for inflammatory bowel disease. So um, first, just a little bit of overview. How, how are small molecules, uh, small molecule agents, different from biologics? Well, the small molecules are relatively small in size. That's why they're called that. And generally, they've been synthesized. And when you think of a biologic, this is something that comes from a, a, a vat, basically. It's been grown by a living system. And these are very large molecules produced by those living systems. Small molecules um, occur, are made by a well-defined process. And you can produce pretty easily in large quantities, synthesizing it. It's a little bit harder to scale up biologics, and there's a lot of potential for variation from batch to batch and equivalents. So there are a lot of controls that have to be put in place. It makes it very expensive. Um, often, it's easy to uh, make very pure small molecules, and they're well characterized by simple analytical technology. But because biologics are produced by living systems, there are a lot of different things that can affect them in the process such as the fermentation media, the operating conditions, and so on. Small molecules are usually shelf-stable. They're physically stable for the most part. And biologics really are, are susceptible to degradation through proteolysis or through just uh, uh, aggregation of the proteins, a lot of different ways. Generally, small molecules um, may work inside or on the outside of the cell surface, and we'll show you that. Whereas biologics, typically, they're big. They're not going to really easily make it into the cell, so they work on the outside. Small molecules can be in different uh, dosage forms. They can be oral. They can be IV. They can be sub-Q. But it is uh, really, most, for the most part, biologics are going to be given parenterally, so a different mode of administration. Um, small molecules, however, because they're not targeting a single receptor necessarily on their compounds, they will tend to have more off-target effects in terms of side effects, but things like antibodies have very high biological specificity. Doesn't mean they don't have side effects, but they're very specific in their effect. And small molecules, because they're small, they're not immunogenic. You're not going to develop antibodies against a small molecule uh, because of their size, whereas biologics really can be. So that's an overview. And what about the targets? Well, so if we think about uh, what we understand about why people get inflammatory bowel disease and why these conditions continue, we really talk about the dysbiosis of the microbiome. And there are some things uh, that are dealing with that, such as FMT, that we'll really just barely touch upon. But also, uh, the gut has an important barrier function that keeps uh, invasive pathogens out. So that barrier function is disrupted, so you could think about improving that. There are a whole host of cytokines that are produced. Some of them are good cytokines, some of them are pro-inflammatory cytokines, and some of those you'll benefit by blocking. Um, there's signaling inside the inflammatory and immune cells, so this is a cell signaling process on binding of these cytokines at the surface, and so that's another area that can be addressed with a small molecule. And uh, in addition, it is important to know that uh, you don't get inflammation just from the cells that live in the gut. Basically, these have to be brought in from systemic circulation. So that involves leukocyte uh, adherence and trafficking. And that also involves not only the, the blood vessels, but also the lymph nodes and the lymphatic system where the lymphocytes and so on can traffic through. So all of these are potential targets. And we'll give you examples of each of these things. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble advancing. Here we go. So we talked about uh, anti-leukocyte trafficking. Uh, that's one, one mode that you can block with small molecules as well as biologics, as you'll hear. And then a new class of medications that are really small molecules address uh, sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor modulation. Um, within the cell, we're going to talk about Janus kinase inhibitors, or JAK inhibitors at some length, and we'll also talk about another intracellular signal, uh, which is SMAD7, and inhibiting that may be beneficial, and we'll describe how. We'll talk about an agent that can enhance barrier function, and finally, we'll talk about a class called the phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitors. So first, we'll start with anti-leukocyte trafficking. Most of the action here has been on the biologic side. Um, but just to give you a clue about the process, you know, there are a whole bunch of different molecules 
that work in a coordinated fashion to bring a lymphocyte or leukocyte that's streaming through the vascular uh, system to a slowdown to land on the surface of the endothelium, roll, adhere, and then penetrate into, in this case, the gut to cause IBD. And among the more important uh, of the molecules here are the uh, alpha-4 beta-7 interaction, that's the integrin alpha-4 beta-7, which is a target for MADCAM. MADCAM is found almost exclusively on the endothelium in the gut. It's also found in the nasopharynx and a little bit in the urogenital system, but predominantly it's a signal by which leukocytes are going to make it into the, into the bowel. So if you can interfere with that process by blocking alpha-4, beta-7, you interfere with the inflammation. Now, Steve will tell you about the biologics that may do that, but here's one small molecule that has been looked at and published on, and it's AGM-300. This is an oral alpha-4 integrin antagonist. And this was looked at in the phase two randomized controlled trial. It's an orally bioavailable alpha-4 integrin antagonist. This was an eight-week study. And these were not terribly sick patients. They had only been through five ASAs. Um, but you can see here that it looks like the study hit its primary endpoint, and there would be efficacy both in clinical symptoms and mucosal healing. The big question for this is you're blocking alpha-4, beta-7, and alpha-4, beta-1. Alpha-4, beta-1 is ubiquitously found and is very important for protecting the, the brain against things like PML. So we ran into trouble with this with natalizumab. The question is, would this oral agent, would that also be an issue? That being said, there are other agents that are more specifically targeting alpha-4, beta-7 that are small molecules that are also in development. Now, another way of dealing with uh, cell trafficking um, you can think of using drugs that are not just compounds, but are actually oligonucleotides. So these are antisense oligonucleotides. They bind to a very specific mRNA, a messenger RNA, which is bound to be translated into one particular kind of protein. And when you give the antisense, you jam the system, and basically you can no longer produce the protein. So it's a very specific way of inhibiting one sort of protein. Now, we have an example of this um, from kind of remote literature, this drug called alicaforcin, which was then called ISIS-2302, before there was an ISIS to worry about in other ways. And um, this was not, it was an interesting concept, but you can see in this study, first of all, the delivery was horrible. Basically, the patients had to get IVs multiple times a week, many weeks, uh, very complicated drug delivery to get these antisenses intravenously and into the gut. But, uh, and the study was negative overall, but it's interesting that if you looked at the highest drug concentration, the patients who achieved that, there actually did seem to be a drop in their Crohn's disease activity index. So it gives you a pause for thought. It might work. And so this has been reborn, and alcoforcin is now being studied as a delivery directly by enema into a pouch for patients with chronic pouchitis. And that delivery mechanism makes a lot of sense. You can get a high concentration right where the inflammation is. Now, it's in clinical trials, so we don't know yet if, if this approach will work, but it's interesting. What about uh, another way of uh, inhibiting leukocyte trafficking? Well, these are the, the sphingosine 1-phosphate recept receptor modulators. And sphingosine 1-phosphate you may not be very familiar with, but uh, these are important molecules. Uh, it, it regulates many different kinds of biological functions, cell proliferation, chemotaxis of the endothelial cells, angiogenesis, but very importantly for IBD, immune cell trafficking, mitogenesis, and also it has something to do with control of heart rate. So keep that in mind as we talk about some of the potential side effects. How does it work? Well, you give an oral agent a small molecule that's a sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor agonist. And when you do this, it binds to the sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor. And that leads to internalization of that receptor so that it's not on the surface anymore. And when that happens, a particular species of lymphocytes that's really important for the memory immune response gets trapped in the lymph node. It doesn't have the ability to bind sphingosine 1-phosphate. The receptor is inside the cell, and then the cell can't make its way out of the lymph node. So they're just trapped there. They're not dead, but you really do see lymphocyte counts drop when you do this. 
And that's one of the, the biologic effects of it. And the cells that in particular are trapped are CCR7 positive lymphocytes, and generally protective immunity is more or less preserved um, because the peripheral effector memory T cells, which are CCR7 negative, um, don't really circulate th through the lymph nodes in this way, while, whereas the naive and central memory T cells do. So you shouldn't be completely immune suppressed. Now, the first in class was Fingalimod, and that's a S1P1 uh, and 3 and 5 receptor. They're different subtypes of receptors. So it's a pan sphingosine 1 uh, phosphate receptor agonist. And this was approved uh, both in Europe and the US for treating uh, relapsing and remitting multiple sclerosis. And it's been used in more than 100,000 patients, a very successful treatment for MS. There are a number of warnings and precautions. There are first dose effects on heart rate. So you see bradycardia, or heart rate reduction at minimum, and there are also potential for cardiac conduction abnormalities, including QC uh, abnormalities, QTC abnormalities, I should say. There have also been observed some LFT elevations, and also macular edema has been seen, at least in animal models. Um, underlying the mechanism of the cardiovascular effects is really the three receptor variant. So if you could get a drug with more specificity, maybe you could do better. Interestingly, there does not seem to be an increase in serious or opportunistic infections, TB, or malignancies with this type of treatment. There are rare cases of PML that are reported, just like you see with natalizumab, but in fact, most of the patients with MS who had an occurrence of PML had recently been on natalizumab. So it's it's uh, uncertain whether this is an effect of the natalizumab or of the fingalimod itself. Um, there are several second-generation S1P1 receptor agonists that have more distinct selectivity, different pharmacokinetics, and safety profile uh, that are under development. And there are quite a few, actually, in development. Fingalimod is the parent compound, but there's focinimod and ancelimod and so on, but the one that we'll talk about is ozanimod because that actually has been studied very successfully in ulcerative colitis. And what you see is that if you look at the, um, the effective concentration 50 um, for the, the S1P3 receptor, it takes really high concentrations to, to bind to the 3 receptor with ozanimod. So you would expect improvement in the heart rate conduction abnormalities. So perhaps a better profile. It also has better tissue penetration, faster clearance, and so, so far, there does seem to be an improvement in the cardiovascular safety profile. There don't seem to be many patients with LFT elevations, and there have been no cases of macular edema. And also, because the half-life is relatively shorter than fingalimod, you see more rapid lymphocyte recovery. So does it work? Well, in this study that um, was published in the New England Journal with uh, Bill Sanborn as the lead author, um, you can see that uh, for remission at week eight, um, it does work. It is superior to placebo. Um, you can see a treatment benefit at the highest dose of 10% uh, over the placebo. And actually somewhat better if you look not just at the symptoms, but you really uh, look at the endoscopy score reaching a score of zero or one at week eight, you see adjudicated central reads at 34%, so a third of patients really healing their mucosa compared to only 12% on placebo. So this really does seem to work. Um, there will be others in the class, no doubt, that will come along. What about uh, Janus kinase inhibitors? I mentioned this. This is another kind of small molecule, and I have to explain a little bit of the biology here. So the JAK kinases are sitting inside the cell. At the surface is a cytokine receptor. The cytokine binds on the surface, and then there's phosphorylation of the Janus kinase, and that leads to further downstream phosphorylation of stat molecules, which are within the cell. And once phosphorylated, the stats make their way into the nucleus and lead to activation of gene transcription within the cell and the production of various kinds of cytokines, all as part of the inflammatory response. So this is all occurring inside the cell, uh, but in response to a cytokine binding on the surface. And you can see it's this sort of mix and match system. There are JAKs one through three, as well as TIC2. And in different combinations, you'll see these things docking to different cytokine receptors. And you can see for yourself, 
Uh, for example, interleukin-2 is more involves JAK1 and JAK2. So if you have different agents that bind different JAKs or different selectivities for combinations of JAKs, you'll bind different cytokine profiles and inhibit that cytokine from uh, causing trouble downstream. Um, I take note of the one at the end, which is erythropoietin, which is more JAK2. So if you were to block things, a JAK2 inhibitor might affect your, your, you might have anemia as a side effect, potentially. So you probably want to select a way for that. So uh, the first example of this in, in IBD is tofacitinib, which used to be known as CP690550. And this is an oral JAK inhibitor, not an IV JAK inhibitor. Um, and in vitro, it inhibits all three JAKs, one through three, but functionally, it's really more specific for JAK1 and JAK3 over JAK2, and consequently, it inhibits a variety of very important pro-inflammatory cytokines such as IL-2, 4, 7, 9, 15, and 21. This should sound familiar from a question, no hints. Um, in the pivotal studies uh, that were done, the OCTIV studies, which were a phase three program, to lead to the, uh, hopefully, uh, the approval of this drug, although it is not yet approved. Um, basically, a study of 10 milligrams BID was uh, compared against placebo, and then patients were re-randomized if they responded in a maintenance study. So it was a very long study, without going into all the details. Um, these were fairly sick patients. Uh, nearly half the patients had uh, come into the study on oral corticosteroids. Um, but really three quarters had prior corticosteroid use. Um, many of the patients, about two thirds, had prior immune suppressant failure, and about half the patients had failed TNFs inhibitors in the past, so pretty sick. And here's the primary endpoint at week eight. I should point out this was published in the New England Journal literally days ago on May 4th, and uh, here's the primary outcome for induction um, in two independent induction studies, OCTAV-1 and OCTAV-2, you can see that um, the drug uh, is superior to placebo with a treatment effect size of about uh, more than 10% in the case of 10 or 13% in that range. If you look at mucosal healing, it's similar to what I showed you before. You see higher rates of mucosal healing than actually do clinical response, and that's because even after the mucosa heals, you can still have symptoms. So this looks really good. You're seeing uh, one-third of the patients healing their mucosa. What about prior TNF inhibition? Did that matter? Well, in contrast to a lot of the other agents that we've seen, th it looks very clear that you can get roughly the same treatment effect size uh, regardless of whether you had prior TNF exposure or not. And you see this for both octave one and octave two, whether we're talking about remission or mucosal healing. And Furthermore, this seems to be rapid in onset. Even at week two, which was the earliest that the partial Mayo score was looked at, you could see a clear separation from placebo. So it works pretty quickly. What about the safety profile? Well, um, in terms of infections, this is in some sense an immune suppressing medication, but really the only infection that comes out to the front is herpes zoster. And I'll show you more about that in a little bit. In terms of cancers, the only risk that you do see is uh, some non-melanoma skin cancers. Um, there would be a theoretical concern for gastrointestinal perforation because this also inhibits interleukin-6, but in fact, the risk for perforation was not increased over placebo. You definitely see some metabolic effects. There's a rise in both LDL and HDL cholesterol, um, and therefore you should check the cholesterol levels probably at eight weeks after starting the treatment. There were occasional patients who had elevated CKs, but uh, no one who had rhabdomyolysis or renal failure as a consequence, very rare transaminase elevations, and really rare cases of lymphocytopenia, neutropenia, and anemia. So probably you should monitor hemoglobin and uh, CBC periodically. Now, a word more about the herpes zoster risk. Is this real? Um, data from the world of RA, where this drug is already in use, suggests that it is real is correct um, if you uh, compare the risk of zoster on tofacitinib against all the anti-TNFs. Um, you can see that while the anti-TNFs don't really seem to increase the risk of zoster, you do see that risk increase with tofacitinib. I believe that with, with the new uh, killed vaccine that should be approved later this year that seems to be highly effective, 
we may be able to prophylax against this particular side effect. Now, what about Crohn's disease? Well, um, strangely enough, uh, even though this is very effective in ulcerative colitis, tofacitinib uh, was not proven to be effective against uh, in Crohn's disease. You do see that in, these, in this phase two study, this was a 2B study, there were high placebo response rates that may have obscured the effect. It's an old story in a lot of Crohn's studies. On the other hand, there are at least two other uh, JAK inhibitors that really do seem to work in Crohn's disease. And one is a more selective JAK1 inhibitor called filgotinib. And you see this study published in The Lancet, um, which seems to show even at week two, there's separation between uh, the drug and placebo at weeks 10. At week 10, uh, it's clearly significant. And if you look at um, clinical remission and clinical response and endoscopic remission, endoscopic response on all these outcomes, filgotinib really does seem to work for Crohn's disease. And then at this meeting, this hasn't even been presented yet, but I took the data from an abstract, uh, this agent, which is apatacitinib, and it took me a little while to pronounce that correctly, also called ABT-494. It's also a JAK1 inhibitor, and this one also seems to be effective in treating Crohn's disease. So this is a class of agents that is coming, and I would say coming for both UC and for Crohn's. Now, for something a little different, we'll talk about SMAD7 inhibition, and this is, relates to a drug called Mondrosin, and uh, you, you need to understand this pathway, transforming growth factor beta, TGF beta, is a down-regulatory cytokine. It doesn't create inflammation, it promotes healing. So this is something that you wanna be able to respond to. What's been learned is that SMAD7, which is part of the intracellular signaling downstream of TGF-beta, is very high in patients with IBD. So if you can interfere with SMAD7, then you'll allow response of the cell to TGF-beta, which should be beneficial. So that's the whole idea of Mondrosin, which is an antisense oligonucleotide to jam SMAD7. And in this really spectacular result from the New England Journal a couple of years ago now, this drug seemed to be highly effective. Now, this is entering phase three, so we don't yet know how good it is. Moving on to the last two kinds of agents, we'll mention phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitors, or PDE4 inhibitors. This is a complex pathway, but basically it's downstream of cyclic AMP, and I don't expect you can see all this, but basically what you can uh, glean is that if you block uh, PDE4, you will inhibit all sorts of downstream pro-inflammatory events within the cell. So this also works within the cell, but it's a chemical compound. And there are a number of these that are, that are in use. Um, this one has been tried in ulcerative class. It's called Tetomolast. And uh, this study, and I think, uh, Steve, you, you were the lead author on this, um, it really seemed to show some efficacy. This is a disease activity score at the highest dose that was studied, and the second and the lower dose seemed to be effective. And in sigmoidoscopic score, you could see by eight weeks, um, it really was significantly effective. But the problem with this agent is the side effect profile. So a third of patients had nausea at the highest dose, which was most effective. There were patients who had vomiting, fatigue, dizziness, and headache. Um, because these things are, um, at least this one, is centrally available in the CNS. And it also stimulates the area postrema, which if you recall from your neuroanatomy, is responsible for nausea and vomiting. The good news is that this agent didn't increase opportunistic infections. Now, it's worth noting that there are other agents, there's one called a premolast, which seems to be a little, have less CNS penetration. So the hope is that it's gonna have the efficacy of tetomolast, but not the, the nausea and vomiting. And the last round is enhancing mucosal barrier in function. And so we've known for a long time that the mucosal barrier is disrupted in ulcerative colitis. There's a mucus layer that the bacteria can penetrate through and they shouldn't be able to and then they make contact with the intestinal epithelium where they stimulate inflammation. So this is interesting because phosphatidylcholine is a way of boosting the mucosal barrier. And this has been studied as an agent called LTO2 in ulcerative colitis. All the work has been done in Europe. To my knowledge, none of it in the US. And here are the patients. You can see they were not horribly sick, but they were sick. 
Um, they had been uh, mostly on 5-ASAs, but only about a third were on steroids. Very few had been through azathioprine. So th this is not a very sick population of patients, but still, in the primary analysis, it does appear that the patients had symptomatic benefit over time. So there was more, a better drop in the disease activity index in the patients who got the drug compared to the patients who got placebo. And if you look more closely at the secondary outcomes, um, things like histologic remission and mucosal healing really are clearly superior. So I think this drug probably actually does work in uh, the mild patient population. So I've shown you a lot of different mechanisms and mentioned a lot of different agents, but just to summarize, the advantages of small molecules are that they have reliable pharmacokinetics, they're orally available, they don't have immunogenicity, so they're, they're very convenient. And there are a lot of different mechanisms that are being studied, leukocyte trafficking, S1P1 receptor modulation, JAK inhibition, a major comer in the field, SMAD7 inhibition, PDE4 inhibition, and enhancing the mucosal barrier. So hopefully that gives you a better sense of really what is being developed for small molecules, because a lot of the work heretofore has been on biologics.